Hey, Outliers. Welcome to another episode of Outlier Academy, where I interview entrepreneurs, investors, and icons that are in the top 1% of their field, all to decode what they've mastered and tease out the habits, influences, and lessons that have propelled them to the top. I'm Daniel Scrivener, and on today's show, we explore what it's like to strike out on your own and launch your first venture capital fund with Addie Lerner of Avid Ventures. In this episode, we explore how Addie's background at Goldman Sachs and General Catalyst informs her approach at Avid, how Avid brings analytical rigor to their investing process, and why they think as carefully about the downside as they do about the upside on every investment. As a reminder, you can find the show notes with links to everything that we discuss, as well as a full text transcript at outlieracademy.com. And if you haven't, follow us now at Outlier Academy on Twitter. But with that, let's jump into the episode. Addie, I am so excited to have you on Outlier Academy. Thank you so much for the time and welcome to the show. Thank you, Daniel. I'm so excited to be here. So I want to start, for anyone that's not familiar with you, not familiar with your background, your background is super fascinating in that you've worked at a bunch of different funds before launching your own fund. So can you just, I guess, give us a little kind of thumbnail sketch of your background and then we'll jump into Avid really deeply. Happy to. And yes, even before I started my slew of firms that I'll start with a G, <laughs> I actually started out as a international policy major and Arabic Whoa. student in college. So it was a bit of a 180 sort of getting into investing and venture, but I was at Princeton in what is now known as the Princeton School of Public Policy and really loved the global element of studying international policy and finding solutions to problems, which I actually saw a lot of parallels in investing, although the ability to do it in a private market scenario, which was a lot more effectual, which I also appreciated. Was there something that tipped the scale for you deciding to just go into investing? It was two things. It was one, actually getting quite disillusioned with the way that policy gets created and the sausage is made in DC and at the State Department writing my senior thesis on what role the Arab Gulf states could play in an Arab-Israeli peace process. I spoke to a lot of folks who've just been banging their head against the wall on these issues for a very long time. And just understanding the roadblocks within government itself was that disillusionment. And then the excitement of getting into investing, which was a totally new world for me. I was learning what EBITDA was my junior internship summer. It was just such a steep learning curve, and I loved how much responsibility junior folks could get and how you spent the entire time as an investor really being creative, either searching for new ideas, i.e. new companies, or really doing your best to be helpful to your existing companies and create value. So it was that ability to create value quickly and see the ROI on that immediately, or well, sometimes immediately, was incredibly compelling. Sorry for interrupting you there. Sorry, go ahead and flesh out the rest of your background. <laughs> Well, the rest of it is fairly straightforward. So I did end up at Goldman Sachs and their special situations group. So I was investing the firm's balance sheet capital into private tech companies, generally software businesses, some healthcare services businesses, really loved investing, did not love waiting three weeks to sign an NDA. So moved on from Goldman to work at General Atlantic, where I was doing pure play growth stage investing, working with Anton Levy in the internet and technology group. And that's where I really learned how to be a growth investor and Again, tying it back to my undergrad studies, I loved the global nature of the firm and actually got to spend a year in GA's London office, spending time with emerging growth companies throughout Europe and Israel, and really built out a strong network there. Kept getting drawn to these emerging, like very emerging growth companies. And so when I ultimately left General Atlantic, I moved to General Catalyst to focus on seed and Series A investments in companies in New York, and then actually still spending time at the Series B and later stage in Europe and Israel. Worked really closely with my partner, Adam Vulcan, and we co-led the Series B of Rapid and invested in Monzo and Shift Technology. And that's actually where I started spending a lot of time in fintech. So it was definitely an evolution of, of sort of big firm to smaller firm, later stage to earlier stage, and then just dipping my toes into a lot of different industries. Yeah. And it sounds like an incredible setup to you being pretty well prepared to be able to launch your own firm. We'll go on to that and I've got a bunch of questions there in just a second. But one thing I'm curious on is I think everyone's somewhat familiar, obviously, with the startup ecosystem and how things work and how things kind of play out here in the US. You've seen that in the UK as well as in Israel and in Europe. Any, I guess, thoughts for someone that's not familiar with it, anything that stands out to you or is worth sharing from that experience? I think folks, especially US-centric folks, consistently underestimate international founders, and I think especially European founders. I actually remember when I was at one General Atlantic annual meeting, gosh, this must have been in 2015, I think, 
And I just remember a presentation on sort of the economic stagnation of Europe and why there would be very little innovation coming out of Europe in the next decade. And first of all, all of our European colleagues who were there were sitting around looking at each other like, did this really just happen at the meeting of a global firm? But I think what's been really exciting is just how quickly European founders and entrepreneurs have sort of proven that pessimism wrong. And so many of the unicorns that we've seen, especially in fintech, but across industries that have emerged in the last couple of years, especially the last year, have been from Europe. And I think that speaks to what a number of folks have called the globalization of venture and especially accelerated by COVID, the fact that investors can invest in anyone over Zoom, it really reduces the geographic boundaries. Yeah. And just building off on that point, I mean, I'm not surprised to hear you say that US-centric people kind of underestimate European founders, because I think that's true in public markets and in private markets. US investors typically aren't invested enough in China. They don't have exposure to Israel. They don't have exposure to Europe. Hopefully that directionally gets fixed over time. I hope so as well. We're hoping to take advantage of the little bit of arbitrage that I think still exists there in a lot of our investments. In the portfolio today, we have 14 investments so far. I'd say just under half of them are New York-based founders, and then the rest are everywhere else. And I think the last four investments we've made have actually been European founders. Nice. So you're taking advantage of that opportunity. <laughs> so I want to go now to talking about launching your firm, Avid. And I just wanted to start it off with, obviously, you're now at scale, just to, I guess, give the kind of current recap. You're now somewhat at scale. You've got 14 different investments. You've deployed quite a lot of capital. I'm sure you've seen a lot already. But what was it like? Take us back to those kind of the early days. And I'm curious to know a couple of things. I think one is, was there a unique insight that you had that made it so you had to go launch this firm? And what was that kind of impetus to go and do that? There was definitely a bit of a push and a pull after, at that point, eight years of investing in growth and venture companies. I certainly was not sitting there saying, you know what, this is going to be the year I'm going to start my own venture firm. That was sort of a next decade plus kind of dream. There were two things that I think really pushed me to go take the leap and start Avid now. The first was that I had an investor, a long-term partner and backer, who I'd started to get to know over the prior year, who had become a mentor to me. And as we talked about my career and, and how I wanted that to develop and what I was uniquely good at and the insight I had about myself as a growth investor who loved early stage investing, we sort of collaboratively explored this idea of, well, what if I did start my own fund? And what if this investor and backer actually seeded me to go do that? So it was having that encouragement and that push from someone who believed in me at the time, probably a little bit more than I believed in myself and my ability to go do it. In particular, I had a very linear way of thinking about my career. I've gone from brand to brand, from great exit opportunity spot to another, and hadn't really thought about taking this kind of risk where it wasn't a sort of, okay, if it doesn't work out, I'll move one step forward. This was a sort of, I'll either leap forward or fall flat on my face. And a big part of the experience of deciding to start Avid was coming to grips with my personal risk tolerance and ability to, or real excitement to go do something like this. And then the second insight, just as I sort of alluded to before, is it was realizing what I'm really good at as an investor. And I'm really good at two things. One is just very quickly developing a rapport with founders who I like and where it's mutual. It doesn't always happen. But when it clicks, it clicks really fast. And I can build trust and be really, I think, helpful pretty quickly. The second element is as a growth investor, I have this sort of financial modeling analysis skill set that's actually quite unique among early stage investors. And it's actually a skill set a lot of founders don't think they really need until they're a growth company. But by introducing it earlier, I have found so many founders just gobble it up and are really excited to have that hands-on strategic financial advice sooner. Yeah, which is often promised. And it sounds like you can actually deliver <laughs> that at that scale, which is it. incredible. Yeah, delivering and hopefully over delivering on that promise. And we'll talk more about that in just a second. I have one question on that. So I love that framing of a push and a pull and having someone that believed in you, helping you to kind of believe in yourself enough to go and take this kind of leap of faith, which is hilarious because it's very similar to obviously what founders go through every time they have to found, found a business. But I'm curious on that. You have that experience, you maybe doubt a little bit of your abilities or you have that imposter syndrome. You end up overcoming that and obviously launching this firm and having a lot of success with it. What have you learned from that experience that you would tell somebody who maybe is stuck in imposter syndrome mode about launching their own firm or taking that leap? Oh yeah. 
I have a lot of thoughts on this. <laughs> I will advise and have advised folks to really push their own limits of what they think is possible in terms of the risk they can take. If they're thinking if they should do it, they should just go do it and figure it out. That said, for someone who's as sort of analytical as I am, I really, for every decision, whether it's an investment or a career decision, I really have to look at the scenario of outcomes. And so for me, it's getting excited about what the upside is, if it can work. And as an early stage investor or someone who goes to take this risk, like you really have to be a little bit crazy to sort of believe the teeny tiny upside percentage potential is real enough that you can go make a bet to try to make it happen. But then you also have to be realistic, I think, about the downside. And when you map out the downside, it often turns out it's not as bad as your brain or what my coach and I call our saboteurs are really telling us. So to be just actually super analytical about saying what's the worst situation that could happen, what are you really scared of, you find it's actually not all that bad. It's, okay, falling flat on your face when you've launched this venture fund. I think a lot about sort of outcomes, if they're tied to the right decision, right decision, bad outcome, no one can really blame you for how things turned out. And we're in the business of taking risk. So I think just getting really comfortable with all of those scenarios is how I was able to decide to make that leap. And I think for very linear, rational thinkers, often whom have trouble taking that kind of jump, it can be a helpful exercise. I love that. I love the kind of downside planning or thinking part. It sounds really similar to, I've heard it called fear setting exercise where you basically, yeah, you're sitting down and you're saying, what's the worst that could happen to obviously get comfortable there? Because otherwise it's just this amorphous, not very clearly articulated thing in your head. <laughs> it's exactly. difficult to overcome. On that framework though, you also have to be careful, or at least I do, because I often can end up making the upside case of a scenario, my target case. And once you're sort of underwriting that the teeny tiny upside probability is what you're striving to, you're literally just setting an expectation that you're probability wise not going to hit. And so I think just consistently using that downside target upside framework and sort of readjusting expectation setting has been a really helpful way for me to make decisions and handle unexpected situations. That's super helpful. So I want to now talk a little bit about where you invest and where you are in that market. And as I was doing research for this, there's a bunch of stuff that's interesting. I mean, you guys are growth investors. You're in that kind of series A, series B, and later realm. You take a pretty different approach, it sounds like, than other growth investors in terms of the value that you add, the proposition that you sell. So can you just, I guess, flesh out for people listening, how do you articulate that value proposition? And how do you think about what companies belong in your portfolio and what companies don't? We pride ourselves on setting a very high bar for what we promise our founders in terms of hands-on help and then over-delivering on it. And we're extremely proud that you could talk to any single one of our founders and I am confident that they would tell you that we are either in the process of or we have already over-delivered on that help. And so what we promise them, and this really fits into our whole investment strategy, which is a little bit unique. So instead of writing lead checks and trying to take the majority of the round, we write smaller follow-on collaborative checks we usually start at the Series A, and then we try to be disproportionately helpful with this value add, which I'll go into in a minute, and then try to position ourselves to write an even bigger check once we've earned that privilege. We really believe that investing in a founder startup is a privilege to be earned. I think that's an ethos that is lost often, especially Agreed. these days. But we're really trying to reclaim that ethos and have it sort of feed everything we do with our companies. So as growth investors, we have this financial lens and this growth stage lens that we like to bring to our companies. And so we can do everything from being your strategic financial advisor. One founder called us a financial consigliere, which I loved. I might <laughs> adopt that language. And we can literally do the strategic growth model building and unit economics analysis. One of our companies, Value Payments, which is building corporate card and payments software for fleets, SMB fleets, and they are very early in their journey. So don't have a ton of numbers to go analyze right now. But the founder was really excited for us to help them build out their five-year strategic growth model and really think through, okay, this is what you have to, we do a lot of what do you have to believe modeling? What do you have to believe about our unit economics to power this model? And how does that feed back into the pricing as we develop that for our product? And what does that feed into the churn assumptions we have to see versus what is industry standard? And so it's really sort of not doing financial modeling for the sake of it, but really helping break down those inputs or assumptions. And that's super helpful to our founders. The second way we add a lot of value is as this 
outsourced biz dev arm of companies so we can leverage our networks, which after a decade in this world are fairly extensive. And we use that to get customer introductions, partner introductions, and really help with fundraising advice and intros even well ahead of the next fundraise. So we spend just a lot of time with our founders in this sort of finance function realm across all of it. And our founders can pick and choose from this menu of all the things we offer. And it's really interesting how with our 14 companies, we're not doing the exact same thing for any of them. It really is very bespoke. Yeah, it sounds even, especially on that modeling point that you made, it sounds incredibly valuable because you can help articulate something that I think is confusing, overwhelming the first time you're trying to wrap your head around that. And I know plenty of founders that maybe have data points around churn or have data points about unit economics, but it's very different to then model that and do that analysis you talked about. So that sounds very powerful. One of the things I was curious to talk about is how you approach Series A and Series B investing. And part of why I was curious about that is it's an interesting space that I've been learning more and more about recently. And one thing I've kind of you quickly figure out is I think even though obviously most people will think, okay, it's a series A round. You're looking at real world business traction. You're kind of underwriting that. That's not always the case. And in some series A, it's more like a seed round where it's more on the vision and the belief on the team. And then other investors literally take almost like a fundamental approach where they're underwriting the unit economics and investment in the business. So that's maybe the spectrum. Where do you guys fall on that spectrum? And why do you think that's the right place to be? Since when we developed the investment strategy in 2019, the market has evolved so much. And so the risk we thought we'd be taking in Series A investments has shifted totally. We sort of joke that today's Series A's are seed stage companies at Series B prices. It's kind of like the worst risk trade off for as an investor. But what we look for and what we've always looked for and why we think our strategy actually does really well in this type of market environment is we look for what we call non-obvious product market fit. So that's that like stage before you really get there where there's something showing up in some of the numbers and it doesn't have to be revenue. It can be number of active users for our company majority, which just we just announced the fundraise and our investment today. They're building digital financial services for immigrants to the U.S. And so what really got us excited there was not the pretty impressive number of users they have on the platform, but actually just certainly how quickly those have been growing and the engagement of those users. So what the retention curves look like, how many services the active users are using across the platform, the unit economic, how those are shaping up and the what do you have to believe for them to get really, really attractive from where they are today. And so it's those individual data points that on the whole, it's still a very early stage company, but we can see those signs of what look like they will turn into product market fit to underwrite our investment based on that. And so we look for very early and non-obvious product market fit at Series A. And then by the Series B, we're looking for some of those additional proof points that we're sort of mapping out. All right, here's where we are today. Here's where we think the company will get at the B and then all the way up and beyond. And so as long as we can see the company sort of tracking to what we thought was possible, we're able to get conviction to continue to make that bet, even again, if the company is still pre-growth stage. One thing I thought was fascinating about it is it's very similar to obviously seed stage investing, where a lot of seed stage investors, I guess you'd have to be more kind of multi-stage, but we'll make an investment in seed, obviously follow on. You're just doing that at a later stage. I guess one thing I'm curious is how do you think about, say you've got a massive one year in your portfolio that you're going to kind of invest all those points along the way. How much of the total are you investing in series A versus the check show right later on? You mean like of the fund like composition scale. Or, yeah. or with a single company? Yeah, with a single company. It'll definitely be the majority of the capital will go into the next round. Although, depending on what that valuation is, we might only get the same amount of ownership and we've just sort of waited in order to do that. But hopefully, again, that investment has de-risked. So ideally, our strategy is we're going to put $1 million into the seed round. These days, that buys you like, what, 1% of the company? Sometimes we get 2%. And then if we're able to then get that 5 to $8 million check into the Series B as our double down, we're really able to increase our position. Obviously, the incremental dollars, even if it's buying the same ownership, overall will help with the overall net gain that we can then return more dollars at work. And at that point, we're really betting on the uncapped upside that we thought was possible at the Series A. And how do you think about or like articulate that de-risking? So obviously, something, it just, I don't know, maybe comparing notes, but in my mind, I've always thought about There's something very different about having your capital invested in a company and then working with that team and being with them, working alongside them at all steps of the way. You're learning things and you're getting insights, obviously, that might be non-obvious to obviously investors coming later on. 
How do you think about that de-risking and how do you articulate that to maybe your investors? There's two pieces to the de-risking. One is just simply that path that we've underwrote at the Series A. Are they actually chugging along it or exceeding it and hitting the milestones we sort of outlined in our Series A memo? Of this is what we'd want to see in order to double down. So part of it is just about progress and traction. The other piece of it, and this is why I really love our strategy and think it just creates a ton of alignment, is we also hopefully will have literally been working hand in hand with these founders and these teams for those past six months post Series A. It's just so different to get to know a company and a team when you are an investor, have skin in the game, dollars at work, and founders trust you because you're on the team, you're on the cap table. And being able to understand how a company's coming together, understand the company culture, understand how these founders are handling setbacks and are handling when things are not the beautiful story tied with a bow in a Series B pitch deck, that actually is what we think will give us the conviction to, especially in this market, make those Series B double down bets even before the traction might suggest we're ready to. I love that. On the valuation piece, that was definitely something I want to explore. And I guess the kind of question there is, it sounds like just from the research I was doing that obviously you're value sensitive, which I think obviously everyone is to some degree, but kind of your comment on series A are often seed rounds priced like a series B, which obviously suggests valuations are super high. So I'm curious just for your take there on, I think something that's interesting to me is it's not necessarily happening at Series A, but certainly later on, you're having investors like Tiger Global that seem very valuation insensitive, that are just pouring a ton of capital in. So you're potentially competing with players like that. I guess, how do you think about valuation and how that may play into your strategy? The way we can underwrite these super high valuations is really focusing on the what do you have to believe for this to be an outlier and really to have that upside case truly play out. It's why I like our strategy again, because at the Series A, we're able to hopefully take enough risk that we can take seed like risk at the A, which is good because we're being asked to do so at the market today. Half those bets cannot work out and the strategy still works. But I wanted to create a strategy where as a Series A investor, you have that mentality of taking an insane amount of risk to play for the upside. What I've seen in A lot of the multi-stage firms I've invested with or worked at is that when you have a partner, especially a more junior partner, and they have sort of two or three at-bats in a given year, two or three Series A deals to do before they sort of get promoted or evaluated, it really changes the risk profile they're willing to back at the Series A because there's a $15 million check that you have up front that you sort of have to commit, plus another $15 million of pro rata you sort of have to earmark. So to put that in something that you could lose it all, no one's going to do that if they feel like their career is getting evaluated at the next step. So I wanted to create a portfolio and environment where I know that a bunch of these investments will go to zero. And I want to back those binary bet companies because of the upside that if we get one of those right, nothing else will matter. And hopefully we have at least a couple of those in the portfolio. So that means we can actually play in this crazy valuation environment because we're playing for the like, $10 $10 billion, $20 billion outcomes. And even if we're entering Series A investments at 100 posts instead of 50 posts, which is crazy because it used to be like 35 posts. And even if we're entering Series B investments, like our investment in Oyster, which we also announced today, which was a $475 million post money valuation for a Series B stage company, we did that because we really believe this can be a $10 billion company from this point in time. And That's what I love about this stage of investing as a growth investor is it's getting a conviction of what could be, triangulating that back to the founder and his or her team and saying, yeah, this is the team we want to make a bet on to execute to that outcome. I love that approach and the way you articulate it. It feels super crisp. I want to talk a little bit about, I mean, something that I love that you do is this, what do we have to believe is true or is possible to make this investment work kind of as an exercise. And I guess I was curious if you could maybe take us through an example that could be hypothetical, could be real company that's in your portfolio. What I want to explore is when you're doing an exercise like that, it feels like you have to do mental gymnastics because you're trying to figure out, you're trying to imagine a beautiful kind of upside scenario that's not overly optimistic, but at the same time, then switch and focus into de-risking or risk mitigation mode. And you have to ideally be good at both of those or be pretty good at both of those. So I'd love it if you could walk us through an example of that and then maybe talk a little bit about 
how you think about getting both those sides right. Absolutely. So I'll talk about one of our companies, Pento, which is a payroll automation business based between Copenhagen and London, but they're really actually remote. Side note, it's really interesting. We've seen more European companies become fully remote companies faster. Pento was a really exciting one for us. We actually helped bring in my old firm, General Catalyst, and my former colleague and partner, Adam Vulcan, led that deal. So it's fun to get the gang back together. We fell in love with Jonas, the founder and CEO, and his just extremely methodical thinking, thoughtful approach and impressive traction to date. And so the way we underwrote this business, it was an early stage Series A at a very full valuation. We really looked into the space, believed what Pento is doing in terms of just focusing on payroll automation and doing the UI as well as the back end, unlike some other players like Check and Puzzle here in the US. We thought there was real potential for them to grow super quickly across geographies by focusing on this real core competency and partner with a lot of the broader HRIS players. And so we were able to do a pretty intricate bottoms up build and just understand how many companies they had to acquire in London, their first big market, and in the next geographies they were planning to expand into in order to build up to our target case outcome and have that be a case we're really excited about. We then also modeled out, okay, well, what do you have to believe for this to be an upside case and for things to go twice as well for this company and create twice as much value and an exit that if we were to put in another $5 million at the Series B, it would be a very attractive return and risk profile on that investment. So we're always thinking about the B double down at the Series A when we underwrite. We got really excited about what would be possible with the upside scenario. And then for the downside scenario, that's usually a mix of understanding, well, why would something not work? What if our assumptions couldn't prove out? And if we project out the world like that, how much revenue could the business have? How much strategic value could the business have? And then really thinking through, okay, are there strategics out there that would love to own a business like that? And we really do think that an ADP would love to own a business like Pento. Moving beyond pure payroll, I think some of the larger, more developed HRIS players would love to corner the market by owning a company like Pento. And so we understand, okay, how acquisitive have they been? How much cash do they have on their balance sheets these days? A lot of companies have a lot. And we sort of understand if that's a realistic exit scenario. And so oftentimes our downside case looks like an early exit case. Obviously, the real downside is wipe out, you lose your money. But that's how we, again, sort of triangulate about what is likely, what do you have to believe? And then we sort of gut check. We don't actually ascribe probabilities to it because I have to remind myself sometimes a model is just a tool. But we do sort of think through what are the likely probabilities of each of these cases and does that feel like the right risk to take in this scenario? I love that model. It seems super crisp. So it seems like a baseline, a 2x above, and then a downside, which obviously likely looks like an early exit or an acquisition. And we try to be intellectually honest about that too. And that's a key part of our diligence work is sometimes we'll sort of sit down to do the modeling and the work and we'll sort of have a really hard time getting to that upside case. And it's like, there's a lot you have to believe that we're just not really willing to make a bet on. Other times we'll go to model a company we invested. It's not yet announced, but we invested in a platform also in Europe that helps solopreneurs and creators manage their online businesses. So it's sort of like a Kajabi or a Hotmart. And when we did the bottoms up build on that business, it's software plus payments, which we love because you can get super big, super quick. The upside case we were able to believe with international expansion was like a 5X, the target case. So that was crazy upside we were playing for, even though there was a lot you had to believe. And again, we just came back to triangulate, okay, are these the founders that we wanted back to be able to go build it? And even if that's like a lower probability case than maybe a pento upside case, it's still worth playing for that upside relative to what we thought the downside protection could be. I'm curious to ask one more question, which is to try to suss out, like, how do you improve at one or the other of those scenarios? And I'm curious, my kind of insight is people are typically good at one of those and not both of those. I work with people who are kind of inherently conservative, who I think would be very good at understanding the risks. It would probably be a real struggle for them to articulate a major upside. So I'm curious if you've kind of butt up against that yourself, or if you have someone on your team that has, and just any advice for someone that maybe struggles to look at a company through the lens of downside or look at a company through the lens of upside. It's funny. My fiance is a growth investor and their team comes from a credit background. So they're often thinking about the downside protection and sort of doing a lot of structure in their investments. And it's so funny to talk about some of these really early stage risky bets with him because 
he's one of my favorite members of our imaginary investment committee because he's always going to point out exactly what the risks are. And it's a really good perspective to help poke holes in our thesis and arguments. But for someone like him, and I obviously have many co-investor friends who think a little bit more conservatively that way, they're great thought partners and great sparring partners, but it can be very, very hard to, as you pointed out, really sort of suspend that disbelief and think about or look to the upside case. It's a little bit like that term you mentioned earlier, fear planning, or was it fear Fear setting? Fear setting, exactly. I think it's an exercise that very conservative and downside focused folks need to do for the upside, sort of like put it all aside. What if it went right? What if it all worked out? And so it is a bit of an exercise to sort of set everything else aside and just like imagine for a minute what things could look like and then work backwards from there on the analysis. You just hinted at it, but I love that idea of an imaginary investment committee because it seems like that could also be really helpful. Maybe there's someone who's incredibly optimistic that always has an upside scenario on that committee. Maybe (laughs) someone like your friend in credit. Yeah, exactly. So we, the investment committee at Avid, it's myself and my partner, Tali, and she comes from Bessemer Venture Partners and so is extremely well-trained in thinking through scenarios and the probabilities. And like me, is very metrics driven, but also has that ability to believe and see what the upside is. We try to always solicit additional opinions and really sort of be intellectually honest with ourselves as we, for every investment, go through the thesis and the risks section of why we're doing the investment, but what the risks are. And it's because of our model, we're often investing with a lead investor. And so we get that sort of effective investment committee by working really closely with co-investors. We also have just really awesome mentors and advisors who were able to sort of run some of these concepts or ideas by. And so much of our work and our diligence is actually leveraging our network, whether it's founders, co-investors who know some of these spaces and industries very deeply. Some of them just tend to be naturally very conservative. Some tend to be very sort of bullish and upside driven. So we make sure we plot their perspectives accordingly, knowing their backgrounds. But I think especially for small firms and small teams, it's so critical to make sure we're not falling into groupthink and that we are sort of really exposing ourselves to any potential blind spots in our thinking. I mean, it seems like your approach is really rigorous, far ahead of where you're at in terms of the perspective of time. I want to dig into one more thing just around your investments in fintech, because you've made a number of investments there. And this is the last thing we'll explore, and then we'll kind of switch over, transition over to the personal side of the equation. But I was curious kind of for two pieces here. One, you mentioned earlier an example of a company that obviously sells software and payments, and that allows a company to obviously grow volume and grow a business really quickly. So I'm curious, maybe just to start, what gets you excited about investing in fintech companies, both at the macro level, kind of the drivers, the tailwinds, and then at the micro level, maybe company specific or just, I don't know, niche specific in terms of fintech companies? I sort of like to think of myself as the accidental fintech investor and Avid as the accidental fintech fund. Fintech was certainly one of our core verticals that we were going to invest in. But as we started investing during the pandemic, I was just blown away by the acceleration of digital adoption across industries, certainly, but especially in financial services. And then that, of course, coupled with the markets also believing that and sort of going wild in terms of relative valuations for these companies, I think we're seeing upside scenarios and outcomes that previously were unthinkable for some of these businesses. And so certainly in a high valuation environment where entry valuations at the A and B are high across industries, you don't have to squint quite as hard to see that upside potential that you're going to sort of shoot for with fintech companies. Again, just really propelled by a lot of the digital acceleration, both in terms of consumer habits and adoption of fintech, and then also banks and financial institutions realizing that they really have to invest in this part of the market, both just because literally folks couldn't go to bank branches in the height of the pandemic, but also because now their consumers and customers are going to be demanding or requiring more of a digital or remote experience. So that's sort of why we've gotten really excited about fintech as a sector broadly. We also just started making some of our initial investments in fintech and Companies like Alloy and Nova Credit and those businesses continue to crush and do super well. And so that's just sort of bred more of a fintech focus and network for us. Some of the subsectors that we really love tie to this sort of uncapped upside, as well as some of the business models, like a software plus payments business model that like we talked about can get really big really quickly. Payments generally can just be massive when you're clipping pennies off the GMVs of some companies that themselves are growing super fast. You're growing both as you're taking market share, but also as your underlying customers get really big, really fast. It's sort of the Stripe phenomenon. They were able to sort of hit the massive wave and continuing wave of e-commerce. 
we've seen that with our company Alloy. They serve large banks and they serve fintechs to great customer segments during the pandemic, interestingly enough. And so as some of their fintech customers themselves grow extremely quickly, Alloy, which they're not a payments business, but there is a transactional piece to their business, they're able to grow on the back of their customers. Same with Rapid, which is purely in the payment space. One of our new companies down in Mexico called Clara is a corporate software and expense management platform for SMBs and mid-market companies in Mexico. And we're really excited to see, hopefully they're going to experience some of the same phenomenons that Brex and Ramp have experienced with some of those customers will hopefully also grow super quickly, overweight any churned customers, and you'll see those sort of U-shaped cohorts among their customer bases. So that's one business model we think is super interesting. I'm curious, and this may be a shot in the dark, because I'm not necessarily asking you to make a prediction, but just thinking out loud, something I'm curious about is it seems to me like we've seen an explosion in the number of fintech companies, and it's almost entered every single industry. So I guess I'm curious, do you think that we're at a moment that that was just unlocked because finally enough things have happened to make that sort of level of innovation and proliferation possible, which would maybe suggest that we're at a moment in time that's just fintechs are going to do really well and maybe that opportunity starts to dry up in a few years? Or do you think that we're building momentum and you think that this is going to continue to kind of ripple? I think we're just building momentum. And maybe that's because in starting a fund over the last couple of years, I had to go through so many insanely manual processes that it's just crazy that there is not software for them. And a lot of those had to do with fintech transactions. So for example, opening the capital call line for our firm so we could fund deals quickly in between capital calls. We're working with Atlantic Capital Bank down in Atlanta. They're great and they're actually quite tech forward, but they're also held hostage to just like the way that these bank and loan documents work. And I had to print like 120 pages out, manually ink sign a number of those documents, and then like FedEx it back down to Atlanta. One of the investments we made in Europe that was based in Germany We had to give power of attorney to someone local in Germany to go in person to notarize the documents the day the deal was signed because we weren't going to be in Germany. We had to give power of attorney to those lawyers. We had to actually get the power of attorney and a certificate of incumbency notarized and then sent in to Delaware to get it apostled. And then those originals had to be sent to Germany. So just the fact that those processes exist make me just incredibly bullish on the potential for software to make things a lot easier simpler. And a lot of that is still the case within fintech and financial services. That's the best answer I've heard. (laughs) You're totally right. If you just stop for a second and think about all the financial areas of your life and whether those experiences feel world-class yet or not, I think that it's definitely below that bar. (laughs) It's so interesting because humans are so conditioned to think that the way things are have always been that way and will always be that way. And so it's hard to realize that the fact that we're having this magical conversation in real time from totally different places was something that seemed like science fiction a few decades ago is hard for us to comprehend just in the same way that the really annoying things that we have to do, like apostling documents and sending them to Germany, hopefully will be totally outdated in another few decades or hopefully sooner. Especially stuff like notarizing, signing documents, all of that stuff. It's insane how much of that in the investment industry and banking industry is still manual. And most people don't bat an eyelid at that. (laughs) Mortgage is another industry that I thankfully have not yet had to go through that process. But from all my friends who have, it's incredible how outdated that industry is. And one of our company's staircase is developing automation APIs in order to streamline so much of that from the back end to ultimately make it a much better experience for the consumer. But yeah, I think within all elements of fintech, there's so much opportunity to drive increased automation and a better UX for consumers. And the TAM couldn't be larger. So maybe that's the ultimate (laughs) bull case over time. For links to everything we discussed, as well as our notes and takeaways from the episode, visit outlieracademy.com slash 36. You can also go behind the scenes and learn Addy's secrets to success in the second portion of this interview. To dive deeper, visit outlieracademy.com. There you can find more conversations with incredible guests like Scott Belsky, Kevin Kelly, Erling Kagi, Paula Ferris, and Mark Sisson. You can also sign up for our free weekly newsletter, Outlier Debrief. Every week on Friday, we share a few highlights from our latest episode with a few of our favorite books, articles, headlines, and moments from that week. Thank you so much for listening. I'll see you right here next week.